into it. Cool. We are recording now. Excellent. Awesome. We're here and we're trying a thing out and I don't know what I'm doing, but it's mostly because uh, this is, oh, what is this? What is this, Rachel? I don't know what this is. Um, it is. It's a video podcast. <laughs> a video podcast. Yeah. But this will be one of those like later on, like, hey, this was the first test of the Pop Archives uh, video vlog whatever I'm such a millennial um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the safest way of codifying this is that it is a practice run but it's also kind of a means for me to get my head in order as to how I am kind of approaching what is ostensibly an article so mm. um a little background uh yeah. so I I and Sam Cross, by the way, uh, I am the owner, owner, writer, creator of Pop Archives, a uh, a website on the internet that is essentially me covering the depiction of archives and archivists in pop culture media. So, your movies, your television, your animated shows, your tabletop RPGs, your podcasts, and whatnot. And I'm joined today. Uh, ostensibly by one of my best <laughs> friends in the whole wide world. Ms. Rachel Thompson, would you like to say hello? Hello, I'm Rachel. I just got done at the gym, so yeah. just I, I, had to, I had to add that because I feel very <laughs> self-conscious. Uh, Sam and I have been friends since 2008, right? Or we met in 2008? I think we met in 2008. And then yeah, we cause... became good friends in the 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 years following yeah, in our graduate, grad our graduate days and then continue yeah. being friends which is so weird I um, know right <laughs> we kept in contact what uh it's what I have a lifelong <laughs> friend already <That's> weird. <laughs> I know I'm like wow it's been a while yeah so anyway and, that's uh, an awesome thing yeah it is but, an yeah awesome thing. everyone but, should celebrate uh, one of the friends. things like we bonded over I think was fellow like a uh, shared nerdiness like I don't have the same exact interests as you do but like sure. we have what you mean we adjacent, don't like right? all the same things Rachel yeah I know we have adjacent interests and you know <laughs> and this so. is really like finding out that people have kind of the same like weird sense of humor you do um or we'll just at least go with you when you go on yeah. some tangents yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we found kismet like yeah, kindred yeah. spirits in, in school yeah. and then continuing on. And uh and for the record, we are both archivists. Um we met in a uh, program at uh Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington that was about uh archives and records management. And uh yeah, it's unfortunately a program that's not there anymore, but it um produced, I'm sure, a plethora of amazing archivists who are out there who can you know like shout out in the comments um yeah. <laughs> something like that I don't know um so yeah so I've been uh, Rachel and I have obviously like bonded over a lot of geeky stuff and in the course of that I always often complain to her and several of our other friends about depictions of archives and archivists in pop culture um also at the uh, annual society of american archivists meeting um, there is a segment or a, it's basically an off hours, um, like movie night, basically just called archives in the movies, um, where a gentleman named, uh, Lee, uh, Leith Johnson will, uh, show clips from different movies that depict an archives, um, mostly just archives. It's not necessarily like oriented towards the archivist, but it's just like, Hey, there's an archives in this movie. Isn't it laughable how terrible this is? <laughs> <laughs> um and it's entertaining I mean for the first time I ever saw it I don't know did the first time we see it was that when we went to Washington DC mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it was us and our and our other friend Kara and uh who's also an archivist obviously uh we only have friends who are archivists right. <laughs> yeah, exclusive club. we don't associate with anyone else. no it's <laughs> no one else um except for our friend Kaylin who's history history oriented <laughs> Our friend group is varied, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we were watching this uh, archives in the movies and uh, yeah, it's it's very like standard clips, like uh, in the years following when I've gone or like Karen and I've been there or the three of us again have been there. Uh, 
you can definitely see that there's the same clips are being used in that uh, a lot of like national treasure when the uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence gets stolen um, and used as a bullet catching uh, <laughs> shield <laughs> like you do. <laughs> that that is a movie we'll, that we will get to uh, eventually. Um, a lot of things I'm about to mention we'll get to eventually. <laughs> um, there's stuff from uh, what was it? Citizen Kane is usually like one of the first ones shown. Um, it just like a bunch of different, like a lot of black and white movies, obviously, um, and then a lot of more modern movies. Uh, but it's also very limiting because it's only movies. Um, and I remember just kind of being like, well, there's. I keep noticing because, you know, you get trained in that until you start seeing those things, like that's an archives in that television show, or you could consider that an archives or an archivist, like, and then you start looking back on other stuff and you're like, hey, that was an archives in that show I watched as a kid or in this cartoon that just popped up while I was channel surfing. So I started seeing that a lot. And so I made the the blog, basically, the website is just kind of me chronicling all of these things that I have found or have just kind of remembered from the past of different instances of archives and archivists. And so today, what we are covering basically is, um, was an idea I had for an article because I'm a big podcast listener, uh, which Rachel knows. Uh, I used to listen to them a lot more when I rode the bus into work. Um, which I'm sure everyone's kind of podcast listening routine has been changed over time. Um, but uh, so I started noticing that there was also a lot of horror podcasts initially that have an archives element to them. Either they take place in an archives or it is archival in nature as to like the premise of the, the podcast or the kind of like the conceit for why are we recording this? Because um, one must have an excuse. Uh, so thus the article idea was born. What I did not fully comprehend was the amount of stuff I would have to listen to. Um, and I've listened to a lot. I, I have my notes up here actually on the computer and I have 16 pages of notes on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight podcasts so far that I have listened to. <laughs> two pages each. <laughs> Actually, some of them are taking up more space because it's like when we get to it, like, so something like the Magnus Archives, because I've listened to it entirely and I have a very good memory for certain things. Like I don't need as many notes on that because it's like fresh right up here. Um, whereas something like, the storage papers, which I have a less high opinion of, and we'll get into that, um, it takes up more space where I have to be going like, why? Why is this happening? Why am I still here? <laughs> you know, those existential notes you have to <laughs> write to yourself. <laughs> um, and so uh, in the interest of not only like uh, just talking it out, because sometimes that helps me when I'm writing, but also just to kind of get my head, uh, kind of kind of wrap my head around everything that I've listened to thus far. Uh, I roped Rachel into acting as referee um, to keep me on track <laughs> and to add her opinion uh, to the uh, probably like one or two she's maybe listened to other than, other than Magnus, I think is the only one you listen to almost entirely. Yeah. yeah. So close to the end. So close. <laughs> We need to talk about this, Rachel. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. Ugh, you're the worst best friend ever. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just making it so hard for me to do my <laughs> job, my side hustle. What is this? <laughs> so that is where we are today. Um, so I guess we should just start, correct? Sure. Correct. Yeah, okay. Good. I'll try really hard to referee and not just listen <laughs> jump in and and uh you know add my two cents so <laughs> I'm gonna start with I, I want to start with the ones that I can get out of the way quickly because I'm going to do I want to do more in depth like whether it's a video or it's just a regular like audio the ones that I can kind of get through quickly because I know I'm going to be expanding on them in the future um yeah. for whatever reason so let's start with Magnus because uh you've listened to it for the most you know almost all the way through I have listened to it and I'm like low-key obsessed, just a little bit. 
a little bit. Like, I think, I think I actually recommend, did I recommend Magnus to you or did you just go with it because I was posting shit on it or something? A combination, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I um, knew you, you liked it a lot and I was intrigued by what you were posting. And mm-hmm. um, so there might've been a, you should listen to this in there, but know, yeah. it was, it was Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was yeah, there. that's exactly. Yeah. Anything I post on Twitter is an uh, is an implication that you should watch or listen to, it. unless it's you know. Yeah, unless I say other words. <laughs> Everyone just assume that I'm posting things explicitly for Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, you're like the only Twitter follower I have. So <laughs> I pretend I have followers, but I don't. No, oh, you have a f- you have a few. I've I have a few. Yes. Um, so Magnus, for those who don't know, the Magnus Archives is a, a podcast, uh, that w- it was, I have to say was, <laughs> uh, was produced by Rusty, Rusty Quill, um, which is a UK, uh, production company. Uh, and it was created by, uh, Jonathan Sims and, uh, Alexander J. Newell, uh, with the writing, um, heavily taken over by, uh, well, mostly done by uh, Jonathan Sims and direction uh, by uh, Alex Newell. And it is basically a horror anthology with a giant meta plot that takes place within the titular uh, Magnus archives at the Magnus Institute in London, England. And uh, Jonathan Sims plays Jonathan Sims, the archivist. And he is a, when the uh, podcast starts. He is a recently promoted um, archivist, uh, started as a researcher, becomes an archivist after the uh, disappearance of his predecessor, Gertrude Robinson. And what follows is, again, what starts out as a horror anthology of every episode being uh, Johnny Sims basically reading you a horror story. Um, and then slowly, like after the first 10 episodes, you start to notice some patterns. After the first 20, you start getting uh, a, a feel for other characters that keep popping up. Uh, Martin Blackwood, played by Alex Newell, uh, uh, Sasha James, um, and uh, Tim Stoker. Uh, so, and then they are joined by other characters later on. But there starts to unfold a vast um cosmological conspiracy of the most epic of sorts that uh, culminates in holy crap season five um (laughs) season five is uh, if i was going to recommend anything like there's definitely like a lot of episodes i would recommend in like seasons one through four because they're all really well done they're all really well um written and acted and like produced in terms of like the soundscaping and music but season five, holy cow, I just, that whole season, just the whole thing, just eat it up because it's so good. Um, it's also a huge change of format. So if you're not into that thing, that might be a, a big deterrent for you. But anyway, um, what I really like about Magnus is that for the first you know few seasons, it is only taking place in the archives. Um, that's the setting, that's the job of the people in the archives. Uh, the archivist is reading the stories and doing a follow-up. His assistants are also doing the follow-up. And then you get kind of like these little interstitials of character building in between. Um, so the primary focus is on the horror story, but then things start kind of, you know, changing and adapting as, you know, the characters become more necessary and the plot needs to be uh, um, kind of unfolding you know, more. So uh, it's just a really good, like, the first season is a really good look at what it's kind of like to be a an entry-level archivist coming into a situation that you have no clue, like, what's happening. Like, you are real green, you maybe have some experience under you, but not a lot, and your predecessor took all the institutional knowledge with them. Uh, which I think a lot of archivists find themselves in that situation many times over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, it really reflects a lot of my experience. I mm-hmm. have a background in archives, but mostly records management. But yeah, walking into a job either with 
very little experience. You know, I have my education mm-hmm. back, you know, my, back, my uh, degree, but that first job where you're walking and you're like, I know the theory, but I yeah, <laughs> what to, I don't know, actually know what to do. And then, like you said, that institutional, like the current job I'm in, you know, there's, was a gap between, uh, uh, people who held my position. And so like, there's just this two years of knowledge mm-hmm. or two years where nothing happened. And then, you know, the prior 10 years before that, I have very little information and yeah. Yeah. So and, anyway, sorry, that really, no, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's entirely relevant to what I just said. So yeah. you're, you're great. Uh, no, it, it's, it's absolutely like, uh, and I know it probably wasn't intended in, in a lot of ways, because I've, I've heard interviews with Johnny Sims where he doesn't necessarily know the ins and outs of how an archives works. And in some episodes, you can definitely see, you know, hear that. Yeah. And, and I never, like, even with the, the website and the things that I have, you know, seen with different, like, movies and TV shows and everything, I never expect anyone to get it right, like, entirely. Like, you can't ever capture a profession in its entirety as, like, some kind of, like, monolith or universal kind of experience or whatever. Um, but, you know, some people you can tell are just pulling it out of their ass, and other people you can tell at least have some knowledge and have applied it thusly. And at the very least with the Magnus Archives, it does at least feel like they did some work or maybe had some experience with, uh, you know, like an academic setting and then just kind of applying it into the archives. Um, The ins and outs of how an archives works, a little little hazy on the details there. Um, I I did a QA and a for actually the Rusty Quill Discord server rip um, a while ago that was kind of answering questions about like from an archivist perspective like how how does the Magnus archives kind of stack up it's just like you know here and there it's pretty good uh yeah I don't know what they don't seem to have a very like well-defined collecting policy but you know the the whole idea of collecting the esoteric and the supernatural that that kind of applies as a collecting policy like I don't know if it's written down anywhere but (laughs) yeah I mean it uh, the, I mean, it felt like the archives itself had a very specific purpose. Like it was very much an institutional archives. These are statements that, that people are, um, coming in and giving as part of the the Institute's function. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean that, like, now that I think about that, it's a really an interesting, because a lot of times, or, or there's kind of two, I'm being super general here, For sure. um, but like there's kind of two types of archives, again, being super generic, but there's like the institutional archives. So there's an institution that um, creates records as part of its, mm-hmm. you know, carrying out its business. Yeah. Um, and then a portion of those records are preserved for historical purposes for the institution itself and um, potentially for outside researchers, depending on the organization. You know, if it's a private corporate corporation, usually the archives are yeah. uh, a little more locked down. And then there's collecting repositories or manuscript repositories. There's different names for it, but yeah. where they go out and say, hey, there's this important, important uh, <laughs> <laughs> I using huge journal terms and all sorts of things, but quote unquote, important important person in the community. Let's go, you know, they, Mm -hmm. they're dying or (laughs) about to die or, you know, they've died. Let's go ask for their papers, um, Mm -hmm. you know, their personal documents, or, you know, there's a business going out of business. Let's take in those. Yeah. Or a club or something like that. And so, um, it's like, on the one hand, like the Magnus archives, I mean, it's a little bit of an institutional archives, but it's also kind of a collecting. Yeah, it's repository. a repository. Like kind it's, of a it's hybrid. Kind of a hybrid. Yeah, it's 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 a bit more passive in its approach because it's expecting people to come to it. Yeah, and give statements because it's very rare. I think in the show where they went out to get anything in terms of like actual statements that you know, weren't taken forcibly by the archivist later on. 
uh, spoilers. <laughs> so yeah, the Institute itself is much more of an insular, but like expects the public to come to them based on reputation. Um, they're not going out and getting um, ar uh, artifacts. They are at the most expecting people to bring their their stories and their you know whatever um, weirdness um, to them. Um, Which, oh, sorry, okay. I was going to say that that's I hadn't thought about that part, but it's a very um, different model than most archives. Like even an, an institutional archives, I'm sure Sam, you know this really well, but like you have to go out and tell people like, give me your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, even if it's in like your, your, you know, your company's policies, yeah. bylaws, whatever, you still, the archivist, the records manager still has to go out to the people and say, Hey, give me your shit. I mean, yeah. excuse me, give me your stuff, <laughs> like follow the rules. So that's a really interesting, like, di uh, diversion, not diversion, um, divergence. Yes. Thank you. Um, that I hadn't really thought about before is, you know, the Institute can be very passive and, you know, have people come to them and it's definitely not the case. in most. I almost think it was supernatural of them but I mean that's true that's true you gotta throw that in there <laughs> <laughs> no I mean and that's that's kind of the fun of listening to something like that and then being an archivist and then just being like okay well what type of institute are they and there's also like I don't know how things because we're both American obviously so there's not like huge differences in archival practices between like the states and the UK but I mean I don't know how uh um because I believe that the Magnus Institute, according to the lore, um, is a private educational, kind of, it's not like a public university where people get degrees or anything, it's a research institute. So I'm also not totally aware like how that works in terms of like UK policy, like all that. So there could be a whole section that we're entirely missing. Like this is just normal for how it works in the UK. I don't know. If you're from the UK, let me know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like, as you're talking, I'm like, eh, I'm thinking back to like Jenkinson, Sir yeah. Hillary Jenkinson, Hillary and Jenkinson. Um, like that kind of passive model mm -hmm. of like, kind of keep everything and people will come to you. Now I'm really yeah. excited. I'm like, because that was really his, his kind of, you know, a, a pretty generic statement of Jenkinson's like yeah Jenkinson was much more so. was just like people will give you stuff and just don't do anything to like act exactly anything. just accept yeah. it and move on with your life um yeah for those who are not <laughs> trained sorry in I got theory, really no no either. this is good <laughs> because these things come up like when when uh we're talking about this like so Sir Hillary Jenkinson who was an archivist during the uh first world war um, he, uh, or became an archivist after the first world war, <laughs> Rachel looks it up for me. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd like... rather have live fact checking, <laughs> fact checking than not. Um, but anyway, around that time, uh, his theory on archives, which again, is going to be super simplified here is the idea that archives are about respecting the purity of the record, which means that when you are given something by someone, you don't do anything to it. You just take it. And then you say that you have it, and then that's it. You don't do anything to actively weed out duplication or contextualize anything, really. You just kind of take what they give you and let God sort it out um, after the fact, which is great, all well and good and maybe worked for a time. But when you live in a world where paper starts to pile up a lot, uh, you tend to run out of storage space real quick. Um, especially in a post-World War II environment, which is when you start getting the biggest shift in um, archival uh, theory and practice with uh, T.R. Uh, Schellenberg in the States. Um, we don't have to get into that uh, extensively, but suffice to say, T.R. Schellenberg's whole thing during, uh, like, in a post-World War II environment was basically we can't keep everything, so we shouldn't even be trying to. Um, and therefore, we should keep what's um, 
what's the, well, let's just keep the best bits and then get rid of all the other stuff. So it's a, it's a much more active role on the part of the archivist with the record versus uh, Jenkinson's much more passive role. Um, and you still have these two schools of thought kind of like going back and forth and being like, well, the purity of the record, but no, we need the space. Um, those kinds of things. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry to kind of drag this piece out, but um, I'm looking at Wikipedia because that's a quick, um, a quick way to do it. So I apologize to all of my historian friends, but <laughs> um, this is an interesting tidbit and I don't have my archives books <clears throat> unpacked, but uh, he, I can't confirm this. He further, as though this is talking about Jenkinson and his kind of uh, archival theory, but um, he, his, so the good archivist, uh, Jenkinson saw the good archivist as perhaps the most selfless dev devotee of truth the modern world produces, and that was a quote. Mm -hmm. um, his creed, the and again, quoting Jenkinson, his creed, the sanctity of evidence, his task, the conservation of every scrap of evidence attack attaching to the documents committed to his charge, his aim to provide with out prejudice or afterthought for all who wish to know the means of knowledge. He further affirmed, reaffirmed this position by designating the archivist as being a, quote, profession of faith, unquote, a serious professional that is uncompromising in their duty. So I, I'm, I'm getting more and more like Jenkinsonian vibes off the, off the, um, the Magnus Institute. And, um, and, and, uh, so yeah, that now I'm like, oh, that's a that's a rabbit trail. I could go. Yeah, down. there we go. Yeah, <laughs> like let's do There's a deep a dive into archival theory and the Magnus Institute. We're gonna do this one day. One day. I know. Yeah, it's gonna so. be a real. It's gonna be a special vlog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so eventually, like, uh, I want to do a, a longer form um, video on the or podcast on the Magnus archives, just kind of going more in depth into different stuff. But suffice it to say. I highly recommend it. Everyone should uh, listen to it. And uh, it's really good horror. And this is coming from someone who is not a huge horror person, like never really was. And I'm um, much more now than I, than I was when I started listening to Magnus. Um, just because when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's schlock. So I got good. I, I have a discerning ear. Um, so, okay. So we'll move on. We're going to move okay. on. We got to move on. Uh, so let's, I'm just going to go down the order of the things I haven't written down. The SCP archives. Okay. So the SCP archives is a, so I'm listening to the podcast. The podcast is connected to a, basically a website called the SCP Foundation, which is, um, what started online as a, it's like horror stories, um, but with, uh, it, it's written by the, the community. It's basically building a world through the stories that are being told in the form of reports by the SCP Foundation. Okay. Um, and they are cataloging anomalies, you know, just weirdness that's happening, the supernatural, all kinds of stuff. And it borders from, like, they have, like, a whole system of, um, kind of uh, identification, like what type of object it is, like, is it safe? Is it, is it an apocalyptic level, like, thing? And then also, like, including, like, um, transcripts of interviews, uh, notes from people who, like, so it's like a whole, like, it's a very elaborate online community that create, that crafts a world of the supernatural, basically. Um, yeah, under the umbrella of this whole, like, SCP Foundation thing. And I think it started also in the, like, uh, I don't know if it started within or if it was adjacent to uh, Creepypasta, which was, like, online horror stories right. and, yeah. you know, memes and conspiracies and all that kind of stuff. So, if not within, then adjacent to. Um, and so, the SCP Archives is actually taking those um, stories and adapting them for a podcast. So it's not necessarily that they have like a whole bunch of writers, they are actually taking them almost like verbatim from the website, which I don't believe has copyright. I don't know if that, some of these things you will notice I have not extensively looked into. 
Um, so I either it's in conjunction with the website and whoever the like developers or um, who run the website, um, or it's because it's fair use, they can. Um, so they adapt these stories and they have ranged from like really solidly, like you're just sitting there going like, my life has changed after listening to this. I, I now have a better perspective on this kind of thing. Or it's just a really weird story about a kind of a creepy clown um, or a guy who, uh, or a, a like all SCPs have a designated number um, or it's a, an SCP that can alter reality to make it into a detective noir story. Like, and, and then the podcast, like how they do that, like how they um, interchange the, the narration change, like over to the, the very like, um, was it Dashiell Hammond kind of like, uh, you know, like it was a dark and stormy night and she was, you know, like <laughs> that kind of like. <laughs> so it's a really interesting one to listen to because the archives is much more, it's called the archives, but it's not really an archives in a weird way like unless and and this is something that I have been kind of toying with like the idea of the SCP archives is a traditional archives in the sense that it is curating a list of stories um there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason to these stories that they are curating <laughs> but they are curating um the the choice of which uh, if I could get one of the people from the SCP archives on here and actually talk to them and be like why why do you choose the stories that you do is it a is it a copyright thing is it a just we like this story and wanted to adapt it so there's that um so it's it's an idea I it, I don't know how much it holds water but it is something to consider because one of the big things in, in differentiating oftentimes a library or an archives or a museum is the level of curation um, and the purpose behind the curation. Um, because an archives obviously is going for much more uniquely created items, maybe like going for what the institution is about, what the society, like there's a lot of different criteria for why a archives chooses to collect what it collects. Um, libraries are much more concerned with publication um, and the uh, making accessible uh, previously published uh, materials. Um, museums can be kind of a hybrid, they can have a, a lot more of a archives oriented um, stance on collection based on what the museum you know, is about. Um, and then they also can have libraries attached to them they all, it's a big old Venn diagram, and it really just boils down to, like, what are you collecting and why, and uh, how much of that stuff have you taken? Um, would you agree with that, Rachel? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing my job correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times we stop with, like, archives are unpublished materials, libraries are published materials, and then mm -hmm. museums are artifacts. But in reality, like you said, it's very much a Venn diagram and yeah. a lot of crossover. So yeah, we get kind of, it's one of the big sticking points for why it's so hard to make uh, archives so distinguished, like especially in media, because people are so, like they have the idea of a library in their head so firmly um, or a museum so firmly that the archives, which kind of combines elements of both, gets lost in that shuffle. And so it's like, it's an archives, but that looks more like a library. It's like, it's an archives, that looks more like a museum. Uh <laughs> well, I think, you know, as you're talking about it, there's a little bit of like, archives are very, um, there's not a lot to see. Yeah. Um, most of the time, or pretty much all the time, the actual materials are back in a safe location. Mm -hmm. um, they're very rarely on display if they are on display. Well, not, there's oftentimes items on display, but yeah. they're usually pretty boring to look at, to be totally honest. <laughs> like, yeah. unless it's the Declaration of Independence, they're Which just- is easy enough paper. to steal, I mean. Right, yeah. But like most of the time it's just like, oh, here's a bunch of words and, you know, there's no like visual engagement really. Yeah. So um, 
I don't know, just that, you know, thinking about, and I'm, I'm going off topic when I'm supposed to be a refereeing, but uh, <laughs> like, that's part of the hard part is like, there's no good visual that people mm-hmm. can be like, oh yeah, I've walked into an archives and seen, yeah, you know, the archives, like there's, you're not going to get a person that. who just walks in and goes like, ah, yes, the archives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think kind of to try and try and connect that to what you were talking about, Mm -hmm. um, you know, is this the SCP SCP. archives? Mm -hmm. Um, Sorry, it's one of the ones I haven't listened to, obviously. It's fine. (laughs) Um, Like taking into, like thinking about the whole visual aspect of it, or not visual, but um, exhibit mm-hmm. aspect of okay. of of things into it. It's like, is it an archive or is it like you said, a library or a museum? Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard. It's harder even because it's a digital, yeah, a digital thing that you know. Recording. And, and, I mean, it's yeah, yeah, basically like. What is interesting sometimes with a lot of these podcasts is the excuse that they give for why the why the podcast exists. You know, um, with Magnus, it's the like we're recording because it can't go digitally because the supernatural. You know, um, with the SCP archives, uh, you have the podcast exists as kind of a thing outside of the reality. Like the the podcast is not aware of itself. You know, yeah. um, so. There have been episodes, though, and we'll give them this, where they do kind of almost step out of the reality. Like, there there was the most recent uh, four-parter called Serapis, which, so there's a narrator, there's there's a narrator um, in each episode, uh, usually the same guy, but sometimes they, they switch it up. Um, but this one guy, uh, John Grills, is the name of the, the voice actor. Um, so in Serapis, the first episode of it, it starts off as your normal SCP. They're giving you the background. They're telling you like the, the level of clearance you need. They're giving you uh, some transcripts. And then it ends with someone coming in and talking to the narrator. And as far as I know, they haven't really done that. Um, I've been kind of like spot checking episodes. I haven't been able to listen to all of them. But f- from what I can tell, the narrator has been kind of like the you know, the, uh, the the godly narrator on the outside, just presenting the information to you, the listener, um, for whatever reason. Um, and they kind of frame it as if the narrator this whole time might have been just recording these for posterity, for research, like the entire podcast is kind of like, this dude uh, has been recording all of this stuff for whatever reason, but he is an actual person within that universe. So, and I don't know if they're going to keep going with that idea, but in this four-parter, it kind of, it reads that way or it, he- you know, or it hears that mm-hmm. way or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting thing, like, for someone listening to it to go like, oh, is this the podcast, like, becoming aware of itself as a, as a thing, like, as a thing within a reality, or is it, like, just giving kind of the, the voice, the, the narrator, like, more to do? I don't know. But it was an interesting, like, change up, um, at least within those four episodes. So if they continue it, that's great. If not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't wreck the, it doesn't change, like, the fourth wall aspect of it or ruin anything. It's just kind of a different way of approaching the story, I guess. Really, uh, it got me thinking about, um, because a lot of times, archivists are forgotten about Mm -hmm. um you you know the archives are truth um you know uh you know you and a lot of times I my experience is more in like tv shows and movies but like you somebody walks into an archives and they have a box on the table and maybe somebody brings them the box but that's about it there's no there's no acknowledgement of the archivist role in collecting the material and describing the material and finding the material for yeah. you <laughs> and helping you navigate the material. It's all just like, 
it's up to you, you know, the, the archivist, if it exists at all, is just kind of there as, I don't know, kind of like the narrator where it's like Mm -hmm. impersonal, not important to the story per se. And they're a a facilitator. Yeah, exactly. And so that to me, the, their, their breaking of that fourth wall and again, I haven't listened to it, so I can't really say, it. but to me, it was like, oh, that feels like acknowledging the archivist role in, oh. in the archives, you know, like, oh, somebody put this together. Somebody is making a choice about what materials there are in the archives, about what materials to pull out for the research, yeah, exactly. like, <laughs> you know, like all of the, all of the decisions and all of the like person, you know, all of the, um, all of the work that goes into that box that's sitting on the table in front of you that you're just reading, mm-hmm. uh, you know, cause a lot of times it's like you, the idea is you open the box and you discover something and uh, yes, you, discovery. and when I say you, the researcher discovers something and, and um, engages with the material and there's no, there's not that acknowledgement of, of all the stuff that has happened between the creation of the materials that Mm -hmm. the researcher is reading and the researcher reading the materials. So anyway, sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool, like, I want to force that comparison. (laughs) (laughs) It's, yeah, it's like when you really start getting into it, like, because yeah, like it's, it's a podcast about a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, more or less horror stories. I mean, not all of them are horror. A lot of them are like very heavily like science fiction or some of them are fantasy or whatever. But these are also like little tidbits of story that were ostensibly within the reality of the world they exist in, comp- you know, compilated and put together by somebody, like maybe the author of the of the story itself. But someone had to do it. Someone within the SCP Foundation had to have put this record together. And then the SCP archives is kind of like, well, maybe this is an archivist who is like recording them for posterity or putting them together for whatever research purposes someone else is doing, you know, based on like their level of security clearance or things like that. Mm -hmm. Like you can make up a lot of reasons why this is happening um, in a way that is actually kind of fun because it's like, we don't know because that's kind of like the whole point. It's like the SCP foundation is about you know secrecy and you know uh protecting the world from these anomalies blah 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 blah. but at the same time if you think about it as an archivist you're like well who's putting these together who's putting these reports together and all this research and everything there's an archivist behind that um so yeah it's just kind of and it's also like as a podcast like just in general it's fun to get into because it's kind of like the same uh slate of voice actors that they're using um, but they're all, they're, they're never playing like the same characters. It's always like they're playing a soldier in this one or a scientist in the next one or this person, that person. Like there's very few like running care, like, like, um, like main characters or anything like that. There's like maybe a doctor or so that maybe shows up, um, a couple of times, but for the most part, every voice actor just can literally be playing anyone. And it's kind of cool, like, once you get used to that, where you're like, okay, there's no set person who's, like, I'm following through any of this stuff. It's just randos, like, on every level, which is kind of cool, because some of these, some of these actors, like, really get to stretch, like, their, their abilities out, like, really flexing. You're like, oh, you should get awards or something. (laughs) And then well, other now people I'm like, are trying to do their best Batman voice. And it's just like, if I talk like this, I'm another person now. <laughs> no, you're not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, like, I want, I appreciate, like, again, with all of these podcasts, regardless of my opinion of them, a lot of work goes into them. Like, I cannot deny that. This is a huge caveat, which I probably should have said at the top, but it's, it, it is still, it still needs to be said regardless. Every one of these podcasts is produced, written, created, you know, edited to a degree by people and people are are putting a lot of work and effort into these things. So if you like them, great. Like I, like I absolutely applaud you for liking them. Uh, Just because I don't does not necessarily mean that you're a terrible person and I hate you. It's just, 
my opinion on a podcast that I forced myself to listen to <laughs> for an article <laughs> that then turned into this because I've listened to a lot of stuff. So there's that. So yeah, I, I feel like I want to stop there with SCP archives because at some point I do want to get into it a bit more, but it's also, I think the premise kind of speaks for itself in terms of like what we've covered so far. Um, unless you would like to talk oh, about Oh no, sorry. I just like, I'm getting really interested in drawing parallels, whether they actually exist or not, but yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. That's, that'll be the next thing that we do is we just kind of sit together and be like, wait, do they? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just contemplate reality for a couple right? of hours yeah. and yeah, we'll just go and then we'll go home. Oh wait. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know. I was like, wait, I am home. <laughs> everyone's getting a nice view of one corner of my room. Um, okay. So next on my list is Archive 81. Okay. So I will say I watched the TV show. Correct. Um, but I have not listened to it. So perfectly fine. Um, I have listened to it, obviously, and also watched the TV show. And that's also going to be another one that I want to do more extensively, just in terms of like, hey, you all adapted a podcast into a TV show, and that's interesting. Um, so we will we'll probably just keep it to the podcast a little bit, but we can go into the TV show a, a little okay. as well. I'm, I'm not going to be stingy on that just because you didn't listen to the podcast. No, I I'm really did. interested to hear about the podcast. Um, yeah. It, so, yeah. So, yeah, Archive 81. So the first season, which is what they adapted into the television show, is the most straightforward of the podcast. It's it's technically three seasons and like, I want to say two, two or three mini arcs. Um, so it's not very long, actually. It's pretty like it's a it's a fast one to get through. Um, so the first season is this is where the adaptation thing gets weird because like Dan in the podcast is just hired to listen to tapes. He's not, uh, he's an archivist in the sense that he's a temp archivist. Like that's kind of the title he's given in order to go and do this thing. Um, it's kind of covered that I think he worked in the university libraries with like outdated machinery or at least with like older um, kind of like uh, tape decks and that kind of stuff. So that's what maybe gives him a leg up, but they don't really like get into like his archival background or anything like that. So he's hired to listen to tapes in this Catskills bunker basically. Um, and as he listens to the tapes, a story starts to unfold involving Melanie, uh, Melody Pendris in the 90s, um, basically going into the Visser building and trying to figure out what's so weird about it. Um, there's, there's nothing in the podcast about her having like mommy issues or a witch background or the, the cult is still there, but there's, there's not as many connections between the characters in the podcast that there are, that they make in the show. And in some ways that I understand that adaptation and in other ways, I absolutely don't get it. Like it's, I know it facilitates a certain amount of like character development or uh, what, what I want to say, a uh, coincidental meeting or uh, convenience for the most part. Because what's interesting about the podcast is that it's about Dan finding a connection with another person uh, 20 years before him, 20 to 30 years before him. Um, and it's only his natural curiosity that keeps him going. It has nothing to do with like some personal connection to Melody um, or like, you know, it's just him being uh, sympathetic enough to another human being that he continues listening and cares about what happens to her. Um, and then just like this, the, there's a, there's an overhanging arc about the, the power of sound and music and the connective tissue of sound and music that goes from the first through the third season. Um, even if the, the, the subsequent seasons kind of take like different routes, like the genre kind of changes and the setting changes quite a bit, but the connect the connectivity between all of these mini arcs and major arcs is this idea of noise and sound and how like music and voices can create music and you know like 
the there's a I think that they do the the hum in the the podcast not in the podcast in the the TV show there's like there's this hum kind of like almost like lullaby-ish uh, sound that characters make uh, occasionally. And that is kind of like the core of the first and second seasons of, uh, and a little bit of the third, yeah. So it's very, like, it's the core, like, what do you want to call it, like, late motif, like sound motif for the entire podcast. And it pops up at weird times, but then if you're like listening, if you're if you're really careful and you're listening closely, you hear it and you're just like, oh, that thing again. Um, so it's interesting to me how they take that, that kind of like general premise of the connection of people regardless, like the fact that you can connect with someone without have, ever having met them. Like you don't know them, you have no connection to them, but still find yourself like feeling responsible for them or needing to help them is so interesting. But then to take that and adapt it into, no, 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 we have to have five to six personal connections between all these characters. Uh, the, the gay character in the podcast has to now be straight washed so that she can have a possibly love interest type connection with the main character. That one hurts. I was wondering about that. Yeah, it yeah. was... It's one of those changes that I don't understand. Other, other than the idea of like giving them another level of connection, like for the, oh, they care about each other is you know, potentially they could kiss. Oh, you froze. Did I? Am I good? Yeah, you caught up now. You're okay. good. Good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of the more mind boggling changes in a show that has a lot of mind-boggling changes for me um but yeah the the melody dan relationship in the podcast is much more based off of a uh what do you call it humanist approach just like we are connected purely by the fact that we are human beings and uh dan and melody were both kind of driven by curiosity like that was it that was their whole driving force dan is slowly not necessarily coming apart, but he's becoming more obsessed with the Visser tapes and with what Melody's doing, purely based off of his own curiosity that then drives that obsession further um, and forces, like, and, and then pushes him to, into more of the, like, further down the hole of isolation and paranoia and everything, which, you know, who among us hasn't felt that when you're by yourself in the cat skills? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, in the in the show, he has a lot more connection via the internet than he did in the podcast. Because, like, he was not contacting Mark, like, every other day, being all like, hey, man, I've got another thing to talk to you about. <laughs> um, and I also, did, like, there's a lot of horror tropes in the TV show that I don't appreciate. Like, I don't like psychological gaslighting. It's... I just, I'm not comfortable with it. It's just not, it's not a triggering thing. It's just not, it's just, just not a thing I like. Um, and also religious cults are done. I'm so tired of religious cults. <laughs> but, and the cult is in the podcast, like it's there, but it's not, I don't know. It's there and it's more of a background than it is. Like the podcast itself is more concerned with, again, sound, but then also with late stage capitalism and the hubris of, you know, a corporation thinking it can control an unknowable thing, you know, like we all do. So yeah, it's, it's a really weird thing to, to look at that and go like, okay, I see why you adapted certain things, but then I don't know why you ignored literally everything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, late stage capitalism. Yeah, late stage. <laughs> it's always late stage capitalism. So, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't want spoilers because I, I think I, I. Well, if they make another season, I'll watch it, and I probably will go at some point and listen to the podcast. But why is it called Archives? Archive eighty eight or eighty oh, one? Eighty one. It's just it's literally the name of the section of the archive that he's listening. Okay. So when Dan goes to the Catskills, he there's it's it's a much bigger facility in the podcast. It's like basically like a warehouse with a bunker in it. Um, okay. And so yeah, Archive eighty one is just the Visser building tapes that. Thing. Okay. So 
that's the whole point. <laughs> that was interesting to me because it was like they get to the bunker in the TV show mm-hmm. and it was like a shelf yeah maybe of tape <laughs> and I'm like this isn't an archives and I know they showed like kind of you know you come to spoilers you come to find out videotapes I guess that's not really a spoiler but you see those kind of to the side but it was still like I, how is this an archive like in the tv show which I know we're, we're not really talking about but mm-hmm. It definitely was like, why is this an archives? You know, he's yeah, like in the beginning, Dan is working in the Museum of Moving Images or something. So he's working in the museum. Honestly, in a TV show, I'm like, does he even get called archivist in the TV show? Like, which is fine. I'm like, yes, the because he's more of like a conservator preservation yeah, specialist a, yeah media restoration yeah, yeah yeah um you know doing you know uh migration and preservation work um seemingly over so I, I was having a hard time being like how is this an archives like yeah and why is it 81 <laughs> yeah so it, yeah yeah the yeah it's really weird like you have this name and it's explained in the first episode of the podcast like they they give you the whole rundown of why it's this section, this archive. All right, here we go. It's part of a bigger thing um, because there's a corporation involved and they have all their records out here in the Catskills for reasons. Um, and so, yeah, for the show to just be like, okay, it's called Archive 81. But it's like, but why? Why is it, why is it why called Why is that? a shelf of tapes <laughs> called an Archive 81? Exactly. No less. So, it's like there's... Yeah. It's one of those things, again, like in Lost in the Adaptation, where it's just like the, you know, the creators, again, they did work. They did some work. There's some level of reverence for media restoration that's going on there. I get it. But at the same time, it's like, did you consult with a media restoration expert? Did you, because you're using a bone folder on that tape. I don't think you should be using a bone folder. Why are you wearing cotton gloves? (laughs) <laughs> sorry I had that moment too I was like oh you're gonna snack oh don't do oh, that like, <laughs> I'm like ah. I'm not I'm not a media preservation person at all but but you can gloves. google that shit like cotton gloves I'm like oh that's probably not a bad idea I think the one that got me more than anything was when eventually when he finds mold in a place where mold should not be um and he doesn't put a mask on it's just like Daniel Dan oh yeah that was bothering me all of the molds yeah that was showing up and everyone's like touching it yeah. and I'm like oh <laughs> my god no we're gonna die it's the 90s but Jesus come on everyone knows you're not supposed to do that with mold yeah, but yeah it's like when Dan doesn't put a mask on he's got the right gloves on but he doesn't put a mask on when he believes mold is involved this is like what are we doing here even in media preservation there has to be the possibility that mold has gotten into something I mean Nothing is beyond that. But again, just assume everything's held together with dark magic and you can move on. Uh, I do have to ask about the rat. Does the rat come up in the podcast? Yeah, ratty's part of the the podcast. Okay. I was also disturbed by the fact that he had a rodent running around loose. In the podcast, it makes more sense because he's not actively working with the materials. (laughs) So it's like, okay, yeah, I can see him having a rat friend because he literally has no one else to talk to and he's bored and he's losing his mind a little bit. And so, yeah, Ratty is, is a character. It's like, I don't, I don't know if they just went out and recorded a rat or just got someone to do rat noises, (laughs) but yeah, Ratty's a character. He talks to him occasionally. Um, And then, yeah, when they do that in the, the the tv show and he's just got him in the box on the table where he's and working on leaves stuff. the room and, and i'm yeah. like a mouse ate part of my car i don't think your tapes are safe with a rat like I, was, I feel like that was the most unrealistic bit in the entire show yeah and that's saying something is that you left a rodent in a box of paper <laughs> on a desk where you are actively working on damaged material and then left the room and that rat didn't eat everything that's unrealistic <laughs> on a level that i 
the discerning viewer could not get on board with. So oh, sorry, I'm like switching gears, but in the podcast, you said that he Dan is hired to listen to the tapes. So he's not doing any transcription, like Nope. He's just listening to that. Does he have to do a, like a report back on what he hears or not? I mean, is that spoiler? No, or? it's, it's more or less. He has a recording device on him that explains why he's being recorded and why the podcast exists. <laughs> Cause the podcast actually, what I should say is that archive 81 as a podcast knows that it's a podcast. Like after each episode, it's actually like you have Mark coming on and being like, this is the recording of my friend Dan and I'm putting this up as a podcast to let other like where is my friend Dan kind of thing so it's a podcast that exists as a podcast okay so that's kind of a conceit of it um and it also goes in with the overall story like the overall um th- theme of sound as uh as a um sound on a grander scale because one of the things that is part of the ritual that Samuel and his cult are trying to accomplish is spoilers that the very act of listening is uh creates the uh like creates the impetus for a ritual to exist because you are listening to the sounds that you like the chanting like all that kind of stuff so you are as the listener kind of complicit in the act of creating the ritual so that's really interesting right to think about wow and i can understand how it it really only works in a podcast format when you're trying to do that there is a way to do that i feel like through video i mean it's the same thing like the the making the audience the witness you know to an event to a thing but also that the very act of witnessing has created the thing that you are trying to avoid is a, like I feel like it's a trope, but it's an underutilized trope. Um, although yeah. you're not there yet, but that does come up in Magnus. Um, okay, so it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. I think it's also um, kind of a standard horror trope in terms of specific writers would kind of do that, where it's like by reading this story that you have just read, you have then released so and so. I think it's a yeah, very yeah. Lovecraft thing to do. Yeah. Um, so, so again, it, it fits into a larger motif of the podcast um, uh, through the, the act of listening and by utilizing the podcast. There's a mini arc that takes, during, takes uh, place during the golden age of, wire, of radio, and it's about like a radio play being performed as a ritual. And it's really cool. And it, it took me back to when I was in high school. And we did a um, we did a show called the Golden Age of Wireless, which was us just doing radio shows and like reading the transcripts of radio shows, which was really fun because uh, uh, you didn't have to memorize anything. The script was right there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> makes it so much easier. Oh my god, best drama experience of my life. So I I'm, I'm gonna do my like. I'm making parallels where none may exist, but I'm having fun with it. But Mm -hmm. like thinking about that idea of some kind of witnessing being part of participating in the, the, the event that's going Mm -hmm. on. And I don't know, I feel like there's some connection there with, again, records, like I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in really like horrible cases where the records are um, like records of like the Holocaust or, you know, genocides and, you know, kind of the worst possible thing. But like For sure. the records themselves were created as part of that, you know, of, of carrying that out. And then now they're acting as like a witness to that as well. And just yeah. kind of, I don't know. I there's not a the, yeah, super the, clear parallel to that, but it definitely the act of creation of a record. You know, like makes it a it, it's a first hand account. It's a you mm-hmm. know you the archivist as kind of like depending on what school of thought you're going with. Like if you're on the Schellenberg side side of the active archivist, basically, it's like you are making decisions based off of records that hold significant historical value depending on whether or not you keep them. 
you know? And so you are acting at, like, you are kind of taking a, you're taking an eye to these firsthand accounts for the most part, depending on the type of record, first of all, um, and kind of putting them together and going like, this is the best version of this event that we can put together. This is the most contextually relevant version of history. Um, and we present it for you to view, see, read, listen to, you know, whatever. Like, I think that the, the archivist as, I don't know if it's the archivist as witness, but the arc, because, and again, it depends on the records you're working with, because if you're working in those museums that deal with like heavy historical events, there is like this honor bound duty to represent it as accurately as possible, which often means people are not gonna look good. Like there's so many, so many people that are not gonna look good. Um, and then also like showing people like, this is the past, this is your past. This is your parents' past, your grandparents' past, you know, all the way down the line. And uh, they were possibly witness to atrocities, witness to wonderful events that happened, you know, as well. And, but it's like, the truth of the matter is that the that history is pretty ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's even it's getting more ugly, quite frankly, <laughs> like as we live through yeah. several more historical events or once in a lifetime eras. I think we lived through like seven or was it seven or eight like uh, once in a lifetime things? Uh, uh, at least, yeah. yeah at the yeah. very least. How many recessions and whatnot? Yeah. But I think that there's something there. Um, we probably have to like really deep dive into it but i don't yeah. disagree with yeah i it's one of those like ooh, that's a cool way to kind of think about it mm -hmm. i don't know how how far i could stretch it out <laughs> yeah. but there there's something there yeah so, there's a yeah. there's a there's a little kernel that we're just gonna yeah. have to pick at and yeah. like, like grow yeah um so yeah that's uh yeah, Archive 81, I actually, I really recommend people listen to it um, if you're a, kind of like a sound nerd as well. Like if you really just like how they, because they create their own music. Uh, uh, Dan Powell, who plays Dan in the podcast, is uh, also a sound engineer and a sound designer okay. for the show. And he just makes a lot of really like interesting, like ambient music, but then also like really kind of like just I mean, just a really good soundtrack. Um, I think season season two and season three are are some of the best. Like season one, they're still getting their sea legs, kind of figuring it out. But he really hits his stride, like late season two, all the way in through season three. So highly recommend. Yeah. Um, okay. And less time travel. So <laughs> actually, no, there is some time travel. Never mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> time travel is just a staple of of any podcast yeah, yeah. um okay so moving on to the white vault um which it just dropped its penultimate episode to its fifth season today which was really good um and yeah because this fifth season i think is its final season don't quote me on that i'm pretty sure but i think it is pretty much wrapped up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and so the white vault is um I would describe it, if you're going to start with the first season alone, it's very much like the thing meets alien okay. kind of stuff. It's very much, it's again, a lot of these uh, shows kind of go with the like found footage angle where okay. it's like, oh, you're listening to a thing that was pre-recorded and then we're putting it all together so that you, the viewer or listener can hear it in its entirety or whatever. Very much your Blair Witches, your, yeah. Mm -hmm but better than Blair Witch. <laughs> um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I watched Blair Witch way back, like when it first came out, like when it was on pay-per-view, I watched it for the first time in my dad's house, which was at the time in rural Maple Valley, Washington. And we're, it's dark. I turned off all the lights specifically, watched it on my own on like this big screen that my dad had. And it gets to the end of it. And I'm just sitting there looking at it going, Really? <laughs> I've never what? seen it, to be totally honest. I just... Eh. I mean, it's... I, I get it. I get it. I understand why people were scared and why they liked it and everything. But I don't know. Like, I was such a skeptical 13-year-old. 
<laughs> I'm just watching that going like, okay, they're just running in the woods a lot. <laughs> I'm the worst. I'm the worst at watching horror movies. <laughs> anyway, that's not the point. The point is the white vault is very good. Um, and the, uh, the premise of the, of the, the show is that you have the documentarian who I think at this point has gone unnamed. She's just called the documentarian. Um, she was sent a bunch of tapes and documents by an unknown person that, uh, basically, uh, that she then puts together, like she chronicles this, uh, expedition to, uh, Nialisand, Svalbard, Iceland, um, or I think Svalbard and Nialisand are two different cities, but it's in Iceland. Okay. So, <laughs> like, uh, Nialisand, oddly enough, also comes up in a lot of podcasts. It's in Magnus Archives, too. I've been noticing these, like, I've been noting down, like, hey, this place keeps popping up. <laughs> um, and I think it's mostly because they keep coming across the same thing where it's like daytime nighttime doesn't last as long like it's much more it's much darker than it is light and there's heavy snowstorms and all that kind of stuff so yeah for, for your like for yeah your yeah um so yeah so there's this expedition that's uh, sent to Nyalasand and uh the these people are ostensibly there to uh look at an archaeological dig site and uh hilarity ensues uh no uh and then horror ensues um and there's in it's told in the perspective of the people who are there their recordings um she i mean it's obviously audio so they can't do like a video presentation or anything but the documentarian will let you know like this takes place at you know around this time prior to these events and uh, the video was like this, like she actually describes like the quality of the video. Um, if there's like long stretches of time, presumably where nothing's happening, but the video is on, like those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's like she's cutting out all the, the riffraff and giving you like, here's the relevant information. And I've assembled it in as close to a chronological order as I can suss out kind of thing. And then... What I also like is that, uh, so the expedition is multinational. And uh, so you have people who are doing the voice actors who are uh, uh, multilingual uh, speakers as well. So when they are doing like, here's a note from so-and-so to their you know loved one or just a report that they're writing for the expedition, um, it starts off like you hear them writing and then they are speaking in their native tongue um, or their local tongue. And then it, and yet, then it will transition into English um, for, the, for the listening audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is really cool because, yeah, you're hearing like uh, one of the, the doctors is uh, Spanish. So you start hearing her writing and then she's saying it in Spanish. And then she's like, and then I did. <laughs> like, yeah. so that, and it's really cool because you get to hear like these different languages and then like the people just kind of like the actors voicing them in their native tongues and then into into English is really it's a really great way of doing that transition um and then yeah and then you get like the horror elements of there's a creature involved and it can mimic voices and uh. you don't know if this person's like fully there or not and uh like what was going on in this weird archaeological dig site and oh, what's that crazy thing um, and it's just really, like, it's so good. It's so good. And I appreciate it so much. <laughs> like, like, I love the documentary. And I think she's probably the best example of what an archivist is, or like the best example of what an archivist job kind of is, in terms of you have these elements that you're, for the most part, and also, again, depending on your institution or company or whatever you're given these records you're giving you're given a bunch of stuff essentially that is not necessarily in an order that makes sense and you as the archivist at times have to impose order on it um whether it's a chronological order whether it's a thematic order whether you know there's different ways of presenting um the papers of so-and-so or the records of so-and-so um but this is, I think, the 
the best prime example I can give if I was to, if I was to give to anyone, like what's an archivist in a, in a, in a podcast type situation, like listen to the white vault, take the documentarian, just call her an archivist because that's what she essentially is. Um, and that's what an archivist does. They create an order to give you the most contextually relevant, most, uh, you know, as quote unquote accurate version of these events as they can based on their own context clues, their own research, like all that goes into it. And so that's what the white vault is essentially giving to you on top of a nice horror story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the, I like that the documentarian, again, I, this is one I haven't watched um, mm -hmm. or listened to, um, but the fact that she's, curating or selecting mm -hmm. or you know selecting um yeah. materials and she's letting you know that that's what she's doing yeah she's um, very she's transparent about the whole yeah thing. She, like you mentioned she's like okay well there's a stretch of film where you know nothing happens the camera's just on or whatever the case may yeah. be um and I'm like that's a really good example of kind of the because the archivist, again, generalizing here, but, you know, the archivist does have to do some kind of uh, um, curation and, you know, selection of materials and, you know, you can't just keep everything because everything, is, if you kept everything, you'd have a lot of worthless crap. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times that's something that gets missed in, you know, even as archivists are talking about themselves or other people are talking about archivists is that they that there's no acknowledgement of hey I have selected the materials that are relevant you know this is not the complete truth this is yeah. not everything that happened mm -hmm. like I think that sometimes gets lost where you know you're yeah people get the box of archival materials a researcher and they don't see again that hey there was like five boxes of receipts that we threw out yeah. because <laughs> like nobody wants to know about the chair we bought the person bought but no, you know, I wanted to know about that yeah chair. yeah and so but and but on the other hand like those five boxes of worthless stuff is also you know you take that out and if you don't acknowledge it there's there's kind of this I don't want to say whitewash, but there's definitely there's this a, assumption I, that that I think there was a term and I, I was looking for this a long time ago. Like it's like a negative archive where it's like yeah. it's the archive of all the things that we didn't include. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, that stuff that gets weeded out that is essentially part of the record, but it's also superfluous to the record. Yeah. Um, we don't talk about that a lot until there are the like stories about like oh they threw all this stuff out it's like yeah because that's part of what my job is yeah I throw yeah. stuff out <laughs> yeah it's like you really don't need like believe me you don't need those 500 boxes of receipts like you it's a waste of space it's a waste of resources yeah but on the other hand if you don't acknowledge it then people think that the box appears with all just the important stuff and all you know it's just the important stuff that exists i don't know yeah no there's a lot like this weird about, like yeah archival labor yeah. is i think really just i mean you've mentioned this before already like archival labor is highly overlooked in most media i mean again you're trying to like boil a job down to really simplistic um ideas that people can kind of wrap their head around when in fact like a job or the philosophy behind a job involves so much more and always the human element. It's like archivists are human beings that are given a task and they do their job. And then at best, no one knows that they did it. And at worst, everyone blames them for it. Um, so like, there's no like happy in between being an archivist and being in like any kind of spotlight, at least not where the, the, the media is concerned half the time. Um, yeah. But you see that a lot too in like how um, archives and archivists are kind of treated in media where it's just like the labor is still not shown enough. 
um, and the uh, the the work of archivists, like the full like the full scope of archival work um, and practice, is too. I know it it would be too much to distill down to like a really like you know bite size uh, thirty seconds of film or something like that, but some people take, some people try, some people fail. <laughs> um, and then there's people like us who are just like, you've, you failed or, or you, you tried, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I appreciate that about the white vault and the documentarian, like, even if it's not intended by the creators. And, and a lot of the times I don't necessarily believe that it is, it's kind of like a happy byproduct of, yeah them just being like, well, I guess this is what a documentarian would do. Um, or this is how we've, we've crafted this character to be, but it's like, it's still, I appreciate it as an archivist being like, yes, thank you. You put together the podcast essentially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, you're thinking about something. Yeah, I, I am. I am. <laughs> So I, I think the other thing that kind of goes along with that is one of the things that I I feel like we really had driven home to us in our graduate program was kind of this, this acknowledgement or um, I don't know what, whether, what word I want, but mm -hmm. the recognition that truth is to a certain degree subjective. Um, you know, like you look at a photograph, this is the example that always helps me. You look at a photograph and it's like, here's a photograph of this event or even just a landscape. And you think, oh, this is, this is the truth. This is what happened. This is what this looked like at that time. Right. And you take it as kind of like the truth of why would a photograph lie event. To me? Yeah, exactly. But what you don't see is, you know, the photographer choosing what to take a picture of, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, any kind of, all, you know, uh, manipulation, you know, different lenses, different, you know, now with filters and then yeah. as the film was developed or, you know, now that with digital images, you know, photoshopped or whatever, cleaned mm -hmm. up and all of that is stuff that, um, isn't necessarily wrong, but there's all this manipulation that can happen with this photograph that it's not actually a, a true version of, uh, you can't assume that that photograph is the truth yeah. of what happened or exactly how it looked like. And, you it's, know, like it, it's, you start thinking about Photoshop and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's kind of like that, like, um, yeah, that post can, was it postmodern idea of like, it's a truth, but not the truth. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. A, it's and a semantics type thing. Yeah. And so, you know, the, this acknowledgement that there's some kind of editing that's happening mm -hmm. or curation or however you want to think about it, um, to archival materials, or in this particular case, the documentarians materials, like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's an acknowledgement that people don't always understand. They don't see all of that kind of like This or this is again been curated or or edited or yeah they don't you know, see like the invisible even, hand behind it kind yeah of. or even you know to get even more simplistic like they don't and I think I'm being too judgmental right now but <laughs> you know thinking about okay I'm looking at a document that somebody wrote it's a first hand account it must be a hundred percent accurate but you also have to start thinking about okay what was the author's intention like what what is their background what are their biases like yeah and doing that kind of deeper analysis and I think if you can start people to think about questioning yeah why are these materials here what happened to them like what's There's not a, here people often all those kind of questions context like it's, yeah especially with historical documents we always have to take into account context like what what time period was this made? Like, who is this person? What is their position in society? You know, like, like diary entries are often a really good source of information, but you also have to take into account the person writing it. Like you said, you know, they are not, some people write for posterity. So they're going to make themselves look a lot better 
than they actually were. So you have to then look at like, rec, you know, like other letters that they sent to other people. Like there's, there's an entire lifetime that you can pull together from the writings of people, of, of authors, of people of note, which, which is why we have history to begin with. Um, I mean, it's, it's why we know the things that we do know about, like, say the founding fathers, like we have their, their diary entries for the most part, but we also have a bunch of letters that they sent to a lot of other people, which also gives you a lot more context clues about personality, about, you know, writing style, about like all these things that create a better picture than if you were to purely go on their journals alone. Like that, I think that's always the thing that what's always great about history and also frustrating about people who are talking about history who don't know it, um, is that like, History is entirely built by context. And it's also built by uh, where you, again, to take your photograph um, metaphor, it's like, where do you point the lens? Like, what are you focusing on? Because if you focus on this one thing, yeah, they look great. If you widen the lens a little bit, ooh, not so great. Um, it's like, you take the camera lens and, oh, there's a landfill over there. Nope, we don't want to look at the lens like yeah, picture. Exactly, okay. yeah. So yeah, no, it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into creating a record. Um, and I think, again, going back to the White Vault, the documentarian makes a really good case for why that, that role is so important. Um, and, like, and also like, giving her that kind of like, I did some research on this thing and I put this together, like I, I, I dirtied my own hands and did a thing. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I appreciate that. And it's just again, it's really good horror. It's, it's not gratuitous. Like, I feel like sometimes that's a problem with horror in general, like, especially like modern horror, is that it's so gratuitous in its gore, and also in how it treats women, um, which is, you know, just an, an immediate off-putting uh, situation for me. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> it's like, because I don't know if I ever told you this, I wanted to be a doctor at one point uh, in my life. I don't know if I knew that. Yeah, no, I, I, I okay. imagined myself being a doctor at some point. Then I realized I was lazy. Um, <laughs> probably wouldn't work out for me. But I, like, I've watched medical shows, like, almost my entire life. Blood does not bother me. Like, gore, like, that stuff, meh. I watch surgery shows for fun. But, you know, a long time ago. Um, but, yeah, like, horror, especially, like, um, visual horror will always go for the like, oh, look at all the blood and guts and that ah, aren't you scared? And they'll do like the jump scares and it's just like, nope, not scared. <laughs> like horrified by your like lack of uh, humanity, <laughs> but that's cool. Whereas with, with audio horror, especially like you have to, the audience has, to, is visualizing something in their mind. And so again, the, uh, Horror, horror audio fiction is a sound designer's medium. So if you can get those sounds right, where it's like you hear the squelching and the, you know, the, the blood and the guts and everything, but it's not to a, a gratuitous point where you're just kind of like, okay, I get it. I get it. There's blood and guts everywhere. You don't have to keep stomping around in it to let me know that. <laughs> um, but they do such a good job of like, crafting the sound so that you feel like especially to do weather because weather is so has to be so rough like because there are scenes um like especially yeah in the first and second seasons uh, significantly they're out in the open in the middle of like snowstorms so you have to like get the sound so that people understand we're outside right now but you also need to hear the people who are talking <laughs> And it, so their yeah. sound design is so good. It's so choice. I'll, I think I'll have to add it to my list. <laughs> like I said, it's one episode essentially away from being done. So you've got plenty to, yeah, to catch up plenty. on. I know I have to wait until everything, the, yeah. the, the thing is over before I can get into it. <laughs> it's <laughs> property. So I can, I bet, so I can binge. There you no, go. it's just, I am always just late to the game. Oh, I mean, those things. I've, I've been late to all of these podcasts. Like when I started listening to Magnus, it was already like mid season four and I had, okay. I had to binge a lot. <laughs> but I mean, I think I started Magnus archives after it did. Yeah. 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 
So it does, as long as you enjoy the journey. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, so that's the white ball. I mean, okay. Going, going any further into it, let me start getting into more like thematic stuff. But I think what, what we're getting down to brass tacks here with these podcasts is like, here's what Sam thinks. Uh, it's kind of cool. Let's try to relate it back to our archives in the best way we can. And then we'll move on with our lives. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's working out very well. Oh. <laughs> okay. So Rachel. Yes. Are you ready to talk about? Oh, wait, no, I have another one. Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, wait, okay. Uh, no, no, I'm just going to leave it to the next two because okay. I've got a couple that I don't think entirely qualify because they're not really horror themed. So I want to stick with the horror theme. Okay. Cool. Uh, if you can't tell all the horror that's been happening. Um, what? No. Yeah, I know. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> uh, okay. So I have two podcasts left that I want to talk okay. about. Now I'm leaving it up to you what order I go in. Do we want to start with the storage papers? Or the Scarab Archives. The Scarab Archives. Scarab Archives. Okay. We'll start. We'll go with the Scarab Archives. Penultimate Archives. All right. So this one is three seasons and I've only listened to two. Okay. And the reason for that is I got real annoyed real quick. (laughs) (laughs) You made it through two seasons, though. I did. And I felt that two seasons was enough because I feel like after that, I got the gist of what they were doing and I didn't care for it. Um, So the Scarab Archives is a, it started in 2020. So it actually, it, it started around the time that the Magnus Archives ended. And I feel like it's heavily influenced by Magnus um, because there is a, a very, like, there's a lot that they're kind of copying um, in terms of like they're using kind of an outdated media to record, uh, you know, accounts of artifacts. Like it's a museum archives that is chronicling these like weird things that they have, which is fine. I actually like the idea of the premise. You know, it's like, oh, it's like a horror warehouse uh, 13 kind of thing, which cool. I'm fine with that. That's a good premise. Um, and then people started talking. And the, the premise of the show, other than that they are, they are reading these things about the artifacts, is that there is some HP Lovecraft nonsense happening um, that involves the five fears. Okay. Or not five fears, they're like five evils. They might as well be the fears. Yeah. Like again, taking a, taking a Magnus bit, um, which, you know, Magnus very well could have been borrowing from other things. But yeah. given the time frame, mm, uh, is a, and they're trying to, like, take over the world. And there's a cult. And the archivist is a big old asshole. Um, and there's a weird thing that happens in the first season because there's the archivist whose name is Delbert East. Dr. Delbert East, um, who has a background in ancient Sumerian, yeah, ancient Sumerian literature, uh, presumably uncovered some kind of, like, secrets about these, you know, uh, fears, evil deities, great evils, that's what it is. I just said it, and I can't even be bothered to remember. Um, Was laughed out of academia, still got his doctorate, though, because well-researched, why not? Um, and then it's just basically like an academic punishment in the archives, which he, in several episodes, talks about how bored he is and how he needs to get back to his real work. And, uh, and then gets an, he doesn't get an assistant, he gets an intern. And everybody treats the supernatural as so mundane to the point that no one is scared of anything. Like it is, it's like trying to be the office levels of casual with things to the point where it's like, you have literally created no stakes. Like no one's scared. You can't have a horror podcast where people are not scared of the big bad because how am I, the listener, supposed to care (laughs) about your big bad and about your main character? And everybody else (laughs) like if you're just sitting there going yeah we're gonna totally kick your ass 
evil. Whatever. Cool. Oh, you're just giving me your big speechifying thing. Cool. All right. Whatever. We'll just get you. Like it's, it's so blasé about its own premise in a weird way. But it's like, I can't be on board for any of these people. I don't like any of them. <laughs> and that's a big deal when these are the only characters. <laughs> Sounds like they're all too cool for school. Like, with the, the, if the archivist is like, oh, this is a boring job. Yeah. Like, Whatever. I can yeah. do better things. And then there's a whole thing with the intern, unfortunately, like spoilers, but I don't care. She dies. Um, because the archivist was, um, presumably he deaccessioned an artifact that, uh, he was like, yeah, it's probably not, it's not as evil as we think it is, or it's not, it's not a thing. And he gives, it's like a ring and he gives this ring to the intern, be like, yeah, she likes jewelry and she dies because of the ring. And then, and that's like, I want to say like six episodes in and it's a 10 episode first season episode six she dies and then he has like maybe an episode where he doesn't show up and is presumably like grieving or has gone to the funeral or some some stuff and then in episode 10 he's conversing with the big bad essentially already episode 10 conversing with the ultimate evil via a, a costume skeleton type thing <laughs> which yeah that part I find funny there's like that part I'm on board with like oh it's you know, like your your store-bought skeleton but evil <laughs> <laughs> see if they'd gone with that kind of stuff I would have been more on board but he's talking to the big bad through the skeleton and he's like the skeleton big bad lays out his entire character like you're like this this and this you're not like that that and that and you'll never be this, this, that, or that, the other thing. And he's like, no, I will be. I've suddenly had my entire character flaws laid out for me. And now I've come around and I'm a new person, I think. And so we will defeat you, big bad. And it's like, okay, this <laughs> happened way too quickly. <laughs> like, like, no, that's not how character development works. Someone doesn't just tell you your character arc. <laughs> you're a bad person yeah okay i'm going to change my whole life this isn't a scrooge three you know three nights kind of deal like the, like three spirits in one night kind of bit this is a man who presumably got someone killed got over it and then decided he was gonna be a better person after a store-bought skeleton laid it all out for him <laughs> It's so dumb <laughs> that I find it hilarious and frustrating. It's like, I know I've been spoiled with a lot of these other podcasts in that they have a short amount of time to get a lot of premise across. I mean, like the, um, like Archive 81 and uh, The White Vault are maybe like 10, 13 episodes a pop. Like, oh, and wow. it's, so you still have a very short amount of time to get all this, like, there's plot, there's character development, you have to introduce the horror at some point, but they do it in a way where it's well-crafted, and you're like, oh, okay, I see how we got from point A to point B, and oh, yes, I'm thoroughly scared and freaked out. Cool, well done. You, you get all of the awards. Um, whereas this one says, like, you have 10 episodes. The biggest thing that happens happens in episode six. And then the main character has his come to Jesus moment within like the span of four minutes. <laughs> like, okay. Also not how character development works. Um, it's just so weird. Like a podcast that I didn't talk about um, that I want to eventually uh, called Forest 404, which is okay. a weird thing to say like out loud, Forest 404. Um, is So it's like a sci-fi thriller-ish horror but not like traditional horror, but it has eight, eight or nine episodes or whatever. So even less. And it still manages to do more character development in an episode, which is about the same. They're all about the same length. Like it does more character development in that amount of time 
than the Scarab Archives manages to do <laughs> in the span of its 10. And, oh, yeah. So that's a frustrating one. Like, yeah. it sucks that you're... And I don't mind if an archivist is an asshole. Like, that's perfectly... Like, the archivist in the Magnus Archives is, like, he starts as an asshole. He's yeah. not a great... You know, he's not a he's not a bad person. He's just, personality-wise, very pretty. Yeah. Um, and then over the course of five seasons... He changes as you're wont to do. <laughs> but he doesn't dramatically change either. True. Like, I don't know. But yeah. But, so it, was, but it, it, oh, it, sorry. it sticks to my, like, it, it speaks to the point. Like, I will give them this. The Magnus Archives, every season is 40 episodes. So you have a lot more time and space to develop your characters, give them room to breathe, you know, like let them kind of wallow in whatever emotions or feelings you need them to wallow in or to come around on. But John the Archivist's like character turn is very gradual. Like you you can even hear it in the sound of his voice. Like he's very harsh, he's very arch in the first season and it starts to mellow out as he continuously gets injured and more people die and like his life just gets turned upside down. Like yeah. But his his voice softens, his emotional character arc changes dramatically, um, but still within, uh, with, um, in, a, in a kind of like a smooth transition where you don't necessarily can point to one episode and be like, that's when it happened. Like, you're just like, no, you'd have to yeah. listen to like five or six episodes to be like, oh, you can hear how he's, his voice has changed a little bit, or he says Martin's name a little differently here, you know? Listen. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in the Scarab Archives... <laughs> 10 episodes it's true not a lot but still but still <laughs> like so was there anything in it that was particularly like this is a really good representation of archives and archivists or this was really bad or was it just kind of like meh other than it being it's so it does get into some nitty-gritty kind of like details about like cataloging um, like the, the conceit of him recording is based off of the fact that he has carpal tunnel and so can't really type these reports, these, uh, um, basically like inventory reports, okay. um, up. So he's recording them into at first a digital, uh, recorder. And then he gets, which I thought was like, oh, cool, digital. So the supernatural isn't infected by digitization mm -hmm. in the way that like Magnus shows it is, or um, I think what White Vault's a little bit, the storage papers eventually does, like Archive 81, where this, there's always kind of this like running theme of like the supernatural interferes with digital because of frequencies and, and whatnot. So yeah. an Archive 81 kind of skirts that by using it to its uh, advantage. Like, oh, okay, signals, interesting frequency. All right. Um, archive, whatever. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but yeah, the Scarab Archives, like, there's some stuff in there where they were trying to, like, I guess, be a bit more grounded in that part of it, but it doesn't last very long is the problem. Um, it's, again, it's like, it's trying so hard to get to the big bad almost immediately without doing the work, is that you just kind of feel like, okay, I feel like we jumped ahead to, like, season three already, and we're only in the middle of season one. And you're expecting me to just like follow along with this, be okay with this super casual treatment of literally anything, anything. Like your soda's flat, whatever. Like, oh, there's a <clears throat> demon in the corner. Cool. Uh, so <laughs> you broke your arm, whatevs. Um, I don't know. It's like, maybe it's just, it's either a case of the writing and the voice acting because some of the actors are 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 doing the job like they're they're emoting to a degree but some of them are so flat and i understand that a lot of this was recorded in the times of covid like this yeah like pretty much all of the scarab archives i think is recorded in the times of covid so yeah everyone's microphone isn't going to be the same everyone's you know sound uh like your uh your echo is going to be different but it's like if you're going to go to the the go through the whole you know uh bits and bobbles of putting a podcast together you have to have 
some kind of script super supervisor. You have to have someone who's editing, someone who hears mouth sounds and goes, maybe we edit that out. Because, and I, this was probably intended, but at, some, at certain points, Delbert East is making the most atrocious mouth sounds. <laughs> like, he's drinking full on, like, right up next to the microphone, practically, or he's burping, or, and I don't, I don't know if that was intended, or if that was just, they didn't have time to edit it out, but it's real annoying. <laughs> <laughs> And it's hard to listen to. <laughs> and everyone sounds like they're hesitating right before they're about to speak. And you can hear their, like, the spit in their mouth, practically. Lovely. And, and that's the thing. Like, I hate getting that nitpicky, but it speaks to the, the quality of the, of the sound. It's like, if I can hear that and it's annoying me that much, I'm not paying attention to your, to your story anymore. Because you have now given me a situation where all I am hearing is someone going, you know, <laughs> like, going, and that's not fun. <laughs> See, wasn't fun doing that either. <laughs> wasn't fun listening to it, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that, and then me was in a 20 episodes of that. <laughs> Just some anger there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Move it. Move it. Um, but yeah, but I appreciate the, I appreciate, again, the effort that people go to to make these up, these podcasts. I get it. It just doesn't feel like the same level of quality was going into it. And I feel like that makes it suffer um, quite a lot in terms of not only like story, but character development. And then just, just audience investment. Like I, like I said, I don't care about any of these people. They've given me nothing to attach to that I could go like, oh, well, yeah, they're a dick, but they have some qualities I like. You know, they're or they're funny. Like if someone's funny, I like that. They're not particularly yeah. funny either. <laughs> like, <laughs> um. Oh, okay. There was one more thing that annoyed me. Okay, and I have to say this because I didn't understand it. So, in the second season finale, there's a radio involved that supposedly, when you're listening to it, it starts telling the future or something like that, and then the voice on the radio changes to Delbert East's voice but it sounds like he's doing like a radio voice like oh yes and then we have this kind of thing happening right now but his voice on the radio doesn't sound like it's coming out of the radio it sounds like he's in the room so there's no real distinction <laughs> between other than the type of voice being done but then there's stuff that's played on the radio that sounds like it's coming through the radio and I don't know why they didn't make the radio Delbert sound like he was coming through a radio instead of like he was sitting in the room with him. Because it, I, I don't know. It was just a weird thing. And as I was listening to it, I was like, is the entity in the room with him? Or is it still in the radio? Because I feel like that distinction needs to be very clearly made and it was not. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> And that's it. That's all I want to talk about. <laughs> it's just, uh, I wanted it to be better and I was disappointed, but now we're going to move on to the biggest disappointment in my life, other than some family issues. Um, <laughs> the storage papers. And I have listened to all the episodes. It's three seasons so far. I, I assume it's going to go for a fourth season you know, potentially another one after, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to keep listening to it, quite frankly, um, because I don't know what it wants. I don't know what the podcast wants to do, wants to be. It, the, the premise of the show is that this guy, Jeremy, is a private investigator, um, and he buys a storage unit for like five bucks and finds a bunch of case files and papers in the storage unit and then decides to read them on a podcast for people like you do um which fine good enough premise you know it's like we found some weird stuff in the storage unit so now i'm gonna read it on this podcast for everybody again huh 
Oh, you froze briefly and then caught up. So sorry. It's okay. Did I, do I have to repeat anything or nope. Nope. Your voice like caught up. It was yay. Really fast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Like that premise works. Like all of these premises work. Um, but then it starts getting into like this, like the stories in the first season alone are very, um, <clears throat> they're very creepy pasta. So they're very like um, short internet kind of stories where it's like, oh, this creepy thing in the woods or this, you know, like uh, this thing that comes at your window at night if you, you know, when you're dreaming or something like that. So it's, it's very like that, like, are you afraid of the dark type stuff? Or um, was it scary stories to tell in the dark kind of thing? Mm -hmm. It's fine. But then it starts trying to form meta plot. And the meta plot revolves around several things. Um, One is demons and and religious cult. Uh, Government conspiracy involving psychics. Okay. Uh, And uh, and then just like general, um, you know, human dickery. Um, it's oh, and aliens. That's right, aliens. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I was trying to, I was trying to think. Like there were three things that, like, yeah. So it's government conspiracy, aliens, and demons. All three are squished into this podcast. Um, and they try to do the 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 thing. Like again, we're dealing with like. The first season is only 10 episodes. I think the second season is 10, and then the third season extends into like a 20, something like that. But at the same time, they're adding so many elements on top of each other that I don't know really what they want to do with all of them. It's like, there's a demon called the Grinner that is also involved in this Project Hydra, which is the the government conspiracy thing, that may also extend to the demon cult stuff, but also might be involved with aliens. Um, <laughs> and, and the guy whose storage unit it was might be involved in all of those things, but he's not talking about it because he has no voice uh, in terms of the show because it's only narrated by this one guy. And that starts to make the premise fall apart really quickly when you realize it's just this one guy reading you this stuff all the time and there's no other voices and he only sounds like that and you can't deal with it. (laughs) Yeah. So I, in preparation for this tonight, I was like, oh, I'll listen to like the first episode of the storage papers. And um, so I put it on during work. Uh, which is always hard for me to listen to podcasts while I'm working, but so I didn't finish it. But the narrator sounded, and again, this was partly, I'm sure, because you had mentioned that you had a hard time with the narrator's voice, but I was like, this sounds like a self-help or motivational podcast Mm. kind of voice rather than it's not inspiring horror yeah, or, or, uh, terror, whatever yeah. emotion you should have creepiness. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't finish it. I don't know again, if it gets better, it was also, yeah. So it was just kind of like, I'm supposed to be creeped out about these babies cry or this baby cry that mm-hmm. this jogger keeps hearing. And it, it was not creeping me out (laughs) yeah Um, so it that was kind of my takeaway from it it was also again I didn't finish the episode so I don't know if the like explanation of what or like the premise explanation came at the end of the episode or what yeah he tries to do like like, a version of follow-up because all of these papers that he finds a lot of them are police reports uh some of them are psychiatrist notes some of them are medical reports um but the i think in the first season pres- like most of them are police reports so these are all like these are all like uh, uh first person documents these are you know uh just, you know sources that anyone you know in our fields would be like ooh excellent yeah. um but also the entire idea that you're reading these reports 
that are about like he does make mention that he's redacting like certain names or whatever but he's also reading some names like he's reading these things that are the property of other people basically <laughs> like the there's a um there's a thing in archives that we call what the right to be forgotten and it's based on this idea of consent where like uh, a lot of the times it's used for things like privacy issues in terms of like medical records and uh you know corporate records that have to do with you know uh personal information like you have the right to tell people like don't use my data don't use my um personal info for whatever this purpose is um but it's based entirely on you the person who this data concerns telling people not to do this like not read it not utilize it not whatever Jeremy on the storage papers entirely negates that that idea like he is just like I'm just gonna read this stuff on a podcast because the the podcast knows it's a podcast another one of those those things which again fine but at the same time it's not until like into the third season that he actually like thinks about the idea like the fact that he's reading these out loud and that he could put people in danger or that there's a privacy issue. <laughs> it's like, you're a private investigator, presumably, and you're only now thinking about the repercussions of reading this stuff out loud to strangers about the lives of these other people. <laughs> it's, it's so many violations. <laughs> like, there's so many violations. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's making me think about like, how do we handle that in an archive? Sorry, I'm trying to like make the connections again, but no, that's, that's like, your job basically. I know, I know, I know. The connections uh, are like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, that's like, again, another thing that has to happen that the archivist has to do is you know, when somebody, let's say, donates their papers to a manuscript repository or collecting repository, however you want to think about it, mm -hmm. the donor has to give consent. Like, yes, people can access this stuff or they can access it, but they can't publish it or you can, can't access this until like my, I am dead and my heir, heir, heirs are dead. Mm -hmm. um, like there's, there's different access restrictions and archivists kind of have to balance that question of like uh is it worth taking this stuff in if we can't share it with people like if the donor is going to say no you can't let anybody access this for a hundred years like is the material worth taking yeah. in it's like what's the and, point of but there's it in if yeah no going to yeah. utilize it for something yeah but there like you said there's that idea of consent that the donor has said yes these things can be open and um, and yeah, like, uh, yeah, so that's definitely a bad representation yes. of archives. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a podcast that frustrates me more than anything else because it's, it's very loose with its meta plot to the point where it almost feels like, especially in like seasons two and three, where it like loses, it loses, it, it loses its grip on it. Like it doesn't really know what it wants to do with it. Other than the fact that Jeremy as a character within the podcast seems to be getting, I don't know, it feels like we're starting to get into some chosen one um, storytelling here because Jeremy seems to have the ability to do things that other people can't. Or there's there's a there are other characters involved, but they are all pretty much under Jeremy's voice. Like he's reading their words or transcripts or whatever. And there's there's an episode right before the season three two-parter finale where we actually do get two other characters with voice actors. And it's so out of the blue, it's unnerving. And it doesn't, <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense, actually, really. Like, you've gone almost three seasons with literally no one else voice, you know, no one else being attached as another character through a voice actor. 
um, <clears throat> other than, and I don't know if like the demon that they have like doing certain things, if he was voiced by someone else or if it was Jeremy just augmenting his voice. Um, <clears throat> sorry. But you have uh, this woman, Brianne Scanlon, who is very much involved in a lot of the stuff with this Grinner demon. And then I think it's like a police investigator, um, Mark something or other. Like, so there's these two other characters who have, I think Brianne's like maybe had one or two lines with this voice actress a couple of times and that's it. But she shows up and so does this guy to read a transcript of a, like a Twitter chat type thing. And it's so weird. Like, it's a weird, it's like a weird play that someone's putting on for you, and you have to listen to it, and no one knows what they're doing. And, and so, like, these, these voice actors have to be playing real people who are also reading a transcript on a podcast, but then they start almost, like, acting it out, like, like they would be the people, but they're supposed to be other people voicing these other people it's a really weird situation and it doesn't work because first of all we've only ever really had jeremy as the sole voice of this entire podcast which is a problem in and of itself um especially when you're trying to um like you can have a single narrator but the narrator has to also have an engaging enough voice for you to want to keep listening to them um you know, again, I'm going to go back to Magnus Archives, but you have Johnny Sims is ostensibly reading you a story for the majority of the episode, but he emotes, he embodies the character of that story he's telling you. Um, he has intonations in his voice. He, you know, it sounds like he's reading, but also inhabiting the character because you have that transition from archivist into, you know, John. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, you know, and I understand again, there's a lot of work that goes into this. Jeremy, uh, I think his name is Jeremy N. N. Spigger, and, uh, I'll cut that out if I have to, but the, the man, uh, who's reading it, his name is actually Jeremy. Um, he's reading this and it just doesn't work on a narrative level if you're not giving it the proper, like, intonations and emotional inflection. So, if all I've had for three seasons is your voice droning on about this stuff, <clears throat> and then suddenly I get these two new voices, and it's it's just it's just jarring, and it doesn't work really well, at least in my opinion. Um, and then there's like these really weird views on women that keep popping up, and again, I don't know if it's intentional, but there are not a lot of female characters in this show. So you don't get a lot of uh, variety, obviously. There's a lot of male characters in terms of like police investigators and priests and blah, blah, blah. But the two like, the two female characters that kind of stand out for me is Brianne Scanlon and Dr. Patel, who's a psychiatrist. And uh, Brianne is, an, is a registered nurse, so she's an RN. Um, Brianne is at many times considered a victim at all, like, for the most part, like, she was the ex-girlfriend of the man who became the Grinner, uh, which, yeah, fun times <clears throat> when your boyfriend becomes a demon, um, or possessed by one, uh, and so she's, like, been living most of her life kind of in fear and in secrecy and, uh, just, like, trying to live a life that is continually haunted, um, and then there's, like, this whole thing with, like, dreamscapes that happens in season three that's really just confusing but she has a hard time with it but jeremy can reach her jeremy's the one who can keep her grounded excuse me <laughs> it's it's all about how jeremy relates to brianne's story it's not about like brianne like really taking charge of it and then dr patel is a character that is brought up in the first season and i think doesn't really show up again until season three but she's basically just a hard-ass bitch. Like, that's it. That's all she is. And when Jeremy encounters her, because she, first she's like, I think it's just notes that she, he's reading of hers from season one, possibly season two. But in season three, he supposedly has a, an interaction with her 
uh, when he's he's going to therapy and she happens to be the therapist he goes sees, which was intended because she's like threatening him or something like that. But throughout the whole thing, Dr. Patel does not have a voice actress. It's all Jeremy relating what's happened after the fact, which is also a problem because when your narrator is only recounting things that have happened previously, <clears throat> again, like the mundane approach to the supernatural in the Scarab Archives, when your narrator is just recounting an event to you instead of it happening in real time, your, your attachment to things is muted. It's kind of like it's deadened because you're not there with them. You're just listening to a story that's happened after the fact, and therefore you already know he's fine. Yeah. It's like, what are the stakes here? Um, but when Jeremy is recounting his visit with Dr. Patel, everything he says skews like really like he's trying to get one up on her. He's always trying to like let her know that he's in charge and she's having none of it. But it's like, and I don't know how to describe this well enough for it, the way it feels listening to it. It just comes off as I'm trying to play alpha male and I'm not getting that from her, but I'm still going to keep playing alpha male. It's like, why do, and I see this with a lot of male characters in horror podcasts right now, or at least the ones I've been listening to, where they are trying to take this very like pseudo machismo attitude towards things. Like, I'm just going to show them that I'm not scared. I'm just going to show them that I'm in control. This is like, that's not interesting. Like, and there's no follow-up to it where they feel like they've, like, they don't talk about whether or not they failed at it or they'll try a different approach or the personality changes in any way, shape, or form. Like, Delbert East just confronts the thing and is then like, I'm a changed man, presumably. Uh, Jeremy confronts and then is just like, I don't know if it worked. Cool. Okay. You want to expand on that at all, bud? You want to... I talk about it for a long period of time again <laughs> like, like there's just this like there's an emotional disconnect um in the storage papers that is for me hard to get over um I know that there are a lot of people who like the storage papers and again like and I've read like comments about people who you know who are like oh it's really creepy and blah 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 and it's like okay if that if that works for you that's great like if the storage paper, storage papers is a podcast that does something for you and you enjoy it, I am not trying to like, you know, uh, rain on your parade or, you know, punch your favorite doll in the chest. Like <laughs> it is entirely based on how I, how I take in content and not only as an archivist, but as just a person who likes things. <laughs> And so that one's, it's a rough one for me. Yeah, I, um, like I said, started it, just, I was not, like, I was like, I should be feeling creeped out right now. You know, this jogger is trying to, investigating a crying baby, like, even if it's, because I think you are told that he's reading a report, but. Yeah, there was no, like, oh, what's going to happen? Or, yeah. you know, like, ooh, I'm, cre you know, like, oh, that would be scary to hear a crying baby. Exactly. Kind of that, like, it's like the, so. the level of immersion that you need um, to kind of, like, to suspend your disbelief in that reality. I don't think it exists as well as it could. Uh, and I think that the sound design is part of it too. I, I think I, because re I remember telling you about this when I was initially, yeah. like yeah. the sound design in the storage papers is reactionary. So it's my, my comparison was like when boy bands, uh, sing about a body part or something like that, where they're like in your head and they like, <laughs> they point to it because God forbid you, you didn't know where your head was or it's like in my heart <laughs> and it's like oh that's where your heart is cool 
I'm glad we figured that out. Um, but the sound design in the storage papers is very reactionary in that sense where it's just like, Jeremy will read a thing. And then after he has read the thing, the sound will be made. Where instead of in other podcasts like the White Vault or Archive 81 or the Magnus Archives, the sound is part of the ambience or ambiance of the scene. And if there are particular things that they want you to notice, they'll kind of like jack up that particular noise or they'll make it more prominent. But it's not the only noise that you hear after a word is said. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, I think it's like, again, the hack episode I, I listened to, like, like they're like, it's a reading a report. Mm -hmm. So you know it's a report. And, but they're throwing in like the sound of footsteps and, you know, the crying baby. And it was just very much like, why, why are you throwing in those noises? Like those noises aren't actually happening. So yeah, why I don't need to hear them. Yeah. What is, what um, is the purpose of the sound design in this reality? If you're reading a report. Yeah. Um, Cause so yeah. Because with the Magnus Archives, again, because it's it's a similar premise of reading a thing and then you get slowly sucked into the story where you're almost like, it's like you, the, the listener, are experiencing the story along with the archivist. Like that's the whole, when you get into like the whole power set of the archivist later on, um, that's yeah. kind of his deal. Um, whereas with the storage papers, it seems counterintuitive to the actual reality. Like if you're reading this as part of a podcast that you that you acknowledge as a podcast, why have you soundscaped a report you're reading? Yeah. Like that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, because like I feel like the Magnus Archives, and again, that's pretty much my only experience, and I really like it. Um, but from what I remember, I'm like, I don't remember any kind of those sound effects like you know, thinking back to like the first episodes, like mm -hmm. the one where I'm still terrified of angler fish. <laughs> Can I have a cigarette? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, like they don't use like footsteps or unless it's like, oh, the tape was left on after the report mm -hmm. was read and, you know, somebody enters the room. That's, that's one thing, but they do um, do some like soundtrack, like music sometimes or something like that to like yeah. kind of help with the the tone but there's none of that like on the one hand it almost feels like the person a lot of times it feels like the person who's giving their you know gave their original report is sitting there telling it back to you because mm -hmm. that's Jonathan Sims is so good at like really em emoting and, and yeah. giving you like getting into that the character um but yeah you never feel like oh I'm walking down the street with them it's always like I'm listening to this person tell yeah. me this thing and yeah um so yeah that was really like I didn't appreciate that about the the storage papers yeah um, it doesn't it doesn't get much better I mean I think they get a little bit better at matching up the sound design with the action as it's happening but like the for me it's just there's a lot of elements that just doesn't work when you bring them together um and that's unfortunate I mean because like I I want to enjoy a lot of these things like I don't go into them going like ha I'm gonna get you because I chose to listen to you because your premise is just close enough to what I do like but I feel the need to to listen to you but yeah like I I wish it had been better um I again I don't know if I'll listen beyond what I've listened to at this point because I feel like and I think with a lot of these podcasts too like once you get the first season out of the way like the archives aspect of it if there was one to begin with starts to fall away because they've established the present, the, the, the reality that they exist in. They've established like how the archives, if it does fit in, where it fits in. So 
it doesn't necess- it doesn't necessitate having to continue on i think past the first season unless they do a significant storyline in which something archives related is is like is there and not many of them do it's kind of like it's just a thing that exists a place that they are or like with the white vault it is part of the um the premise of the narrative and that's fine um, and that's great because it, it just kind of also speaks to the idea of the ubiquity of archival documents, of the work of archivists is that, you know, like, like I said, at best we're invisible, at worst we're to blame. <laughs> yeah. So it, it kind of feeds into that because in a lot of these cases, the archives and the archivists, like as characters, like they don't have to keep existing in a prominent way, but you do know that they're there you know, um, with the Magnus archives, obviously for the, for most of the series, they're in the archives. Like it is a place that they are in. It is part of their job. So you can, you know, you can kind of like, this is there. Uh, the white vault, the documentarian is putting this together. She's creating the archive as you're listening to it, basically. Um, and then other ones, like the premise can fall apart a little bit, like archive 81, really like the archive part of it is it's set dressing like it's a means to an end um it's it's in the second season as well somewhat they kind of abandon that part of it by the third season <laughs> which again it's fine like it doesn't always have to stick in order for it to still be kind of like part of the overall experience um and then yeah you have things like the storage papers and the scarab, scarab archives who are like we have this interesting premise and then we're just going to shoot it out the window <laughs> regardless of what we set out to do we don't even know anymore <laughs> like, or at least that's how it reads to me um maybe someone else sees something like you know whatever if this is a video or if this is a, a podcast or whatever if you want to tell me why you think that this storage papers is a good podcast please feel free because I'm actually genuinely interested in like what people think and like how they process like something like this because to me it's just it don't work so I have to go back to the storage papers I have a um Mm -hmm. do and I, I know it might be spoilers but do do you find out anything about the person who collected the papers? Like, yeah. Like, and why they were collected and I, you kind of mentioned it, but yeah. The, kind of like, is, is that the, the Ron guy, the, who was the, he was like, he was a police officer. And then I think he just kept getting caught up in a lot of these like supernatural cases or something really, it all seems to kind of boil down to this, like demons, um, and, uh, he may or may not be involved with the Hydra project, but he collected all that stuff. And that was his, uh, storage unit that he lapsed payment on because that's one of those yeah. things too, where it's like, you have yeah. all this stuff collected Secret. about demonic possession and project Hydra, which is a government facility kind of thing, like this is psychic stuff. And then it's just kind of like. Yeah, I just didn't pay for my storage units. Forgot to pay the bills. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird disconnect on that part, too. It's like, I don't know if I had all that in a storage unit. I wouldn't necessarily want anyone else to get a hold of it, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and Ron, Ron shows up in a lot of, like different stories and um some of the papers in storage unit are like letters to him like things like that so he's involved but we've never in the course of the show we've not heard him like from a different actor's point of view or anything like that so he's just there and he's untrustworthy probably like you do i mean he's a cop so (laughs) yeah (laughs) but yeah so Oh no, that's a that's a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> that was what what we got here. That was two and a half hours worth of Ooh. me ranting about different podcasts. <laughs> Holy crap, Rachel! <laughs> I 
you I feel like you kept on track. Good. Excellent. Oh, uh, you know, there were a couple of, you know, I don't, you kept on track. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I always appreciate um and I appreciate like, you like jumping in with the different archival perspectives and everything. I think that's that's actually really helpful in like just kind of grounding it more in like what our profession does and then just kind of trying to relate it back to those kinds of things because I feel like I get so lost in talking about the property or being like this thing and that thing like from a media like studies perspective yeah, yeah. or something like that that I kind of like lose the plot on the archive side of it because I'll forget about it and then I'll try to weave it back in later but it's better if it's coming in now 